Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Last week I made a video about multi-layer insulation and in that video there was a segment including state-of-the-art graphics from the 1970s showing Voyager encountering Jupiter. And a lot of you were quite interested in this, so I wanted to go back and look at how this was done and also highlight the fact that NASA and JPL specifically, their visualization of the Voyager encounters would actually be a huge moment in the evolution of computer graphics for the scene. And in fact, the person that created these new photorealistic scenes, uh, he would actually invent a lot of the fundamental uh, ideas of uh, computer graphics. And for a time, he actually worked at ILM and was there when the name Pixar was coined. So there's like a direct lineage from these graphics for Voyager to the modern CGI we have in movies. But going back to the Apollo program, uh, NASA scientists had reached the point where they could do these line drawing diagrams showing what the astronauts might see as they were descending towards the lunar surface. Now this doesn't look like much, it's just simple you know, vector graphics, but clearly it is of sufficiently high graphical fidelity that it convinces conspiracy theorists that the whole lunar landing thing must have been faked with computer graphics. One myth it does dispel, however, is that scene in this great movie called Apollo 13 where they're having to make the correction burn on the back, way back to Earth and Tom Hanks decides on the spur of the moment to use the limb of the Earth to orient the spacecraft. In fact, this kind of navigation by outside reference had been used throughout the training and they had used their you know, visualization system to give the astronauts an idea of what they might see outside the spacecraft. So these movies weren't created in real time. They used a vector display, something like an IBM 2250, and you would basically transmit your vector coordinates to it, it would display them, and then you would snap a photo, and then you would iterate to the next frame, and so on and so forth. So I don't know for sure what kind of architecture it was, but IBM seems pretty likely. So yeah, vector displays, they don't have pixels, they just use a direct electron beam that draws on the display and the, the lines get refreshed. These things were not cheap to be clear. For the price of one of these displays, you could buy several cars. Now, for a quick aside, uh, around the same time, Stanley Kubrick is making 2001, and in several of the scenes you can see spacecraft displays with wireframe 3D graphics apparently rotating. These were not actually made on computer, they were 3D models made of wire and painted in a bright colour. Then they would be filmed against a dark backdrop with the necessary motions. And on the sets, they would have film projectors projecting that film into the displays. But a decade later, vector graphics from a computer would make it into some obscure cult movie known as Star Wars. This was put together by a guy called Larry Cuba, who worked with the PDP-11 and uh, Vector General Display. And these frames, again, they all were not done in real time. It took about two minutes to generate uh, each of these frames. And so coming back to JPL and Voyager, these kind of computer graphics were used in the early days of uh, visualizing the Voyager mission. This capability had been set up at JPL by a guy called Bob Holzman, and he had acquired the hardware, which was a PDP-11, uh, an Evans and Sutherland picture system too, it was a vector display, and a frame buffer, and he also hired a guy called James Blinn. And yeah, this photo was from James' presentation. Here he is working at JPL. I strongly suggest you go and Google him, because he actually gives some great presentations uh, about how he did all this. So by this point, thanks to the power of the PDP-11 and the line display, they were able to get somewhat real-time graphics uh, out of this. Now, PDP-11, how fast is it, you might wonder? Well, it was a 2 megahertz, 16-bit computer that could address 64 kilobytes of RAM, and it had another 64K of ROM for the operating system. So that made it comparable to an early 1980s microcomputer, the kind of thing I grew up with. I started out with, you know, ZX Spectrum, 3.5 megahertz processor, 48K of memory. Some of you may have had Commodore 64s or BBCs or Amstrad. They were roughly comparable to this PDP-11 in terms of processor speed, and none of them could produce graphics of this fidelity. That's because these were all being displayed on an external piece of hardware that was just the display. It was a, a frame buffer with a 512 by 512 pixels, 8-bit resolution, and that meant that they needed 256 kilobytes of memory. That is a staggering amount of memory for the era. In fact, it was apparently implemented as one kilobit uh, you know, memory chip, so there were 2048 memory chips just for the main image memory. 
In short, this was a stupidly expensive piece of hardware, and you know, you would expect that because the manufacturer, Evans and Sutherland, were the leaders, the founders of 3D graphics, right? Founded by David Evans and Ivan Sutherland at the University of Utah, they didn't just build some of the you know, most pioneering hardware and computer graphics. Many of the students that passed through there went on to do big things. Ed Catmull founded Pixar, and then James Clark founded Silicon Graphics. And when I first heard about Evans and Sutherland in the 80s, they were the company that made the graphics for flight simulators, the biggest and best video games that I wanted to play. They are still in that business today, although the company has been acquired by uh, Collins Aerospace at this point. And so in the late 1970s, it fell to James Blinn to try to figure out how to draw these photorealistic images using a computer that wasn't particularly fast. The good news is that he could take as long as he wanted to paint each image, but he still had to work within the relatively small 64 kilobytes of memory available. And there were big technical problems that he had to solve. First of all, there were issues of scale. The spacecraft may be a few meters away, the planets may be hundreds of thousands of kilometers away, and the stars were, of course, light years away. You couldn't really draw those all in the same coordinate system, especially because they wanted to use fixed point math for everything because that was a whole lot faster than using floating point numbers. So he created a series of separate programs which would each write into the frame buffer and as they drew things they would overlay what was before. So you would start out with a black background and then layer in the stars, draw the planets, the satellites, other celestial objects and then finally draw Voyager in the foreground. Each of these would be separate programs writing into the same frame buffer and it would take a long time to render a frame and then the frame would be photographed off the monitor. But before you could draw anything, you had to decide on the color palette. This had one byte per pixel, and that mapped into a palette list. So he was lucky the Jovian system didn't have a huge amount of color in it. So he could sort of stick with yellows, oranges, and reds, and of course, different brightnesses and saturations. So now for the planets. Modern graphics hardware tries to convert everything to triangles because these primitives are very easy to optimize in hardware. But, but with the limited hardware available, uh, it was actually better for him to represent planets as a proper sphere and just texture map those. Where did he get the texture maps then? Well, for Jupiter, the spacecraft was capturing images on the way in for months ahead, and so they were able to actually capture data on what v Jupiter should look like, and then Using the camera orientation, the spacecraft location, the planet, the perspective, they could unwrap that into a texture around the planet. But in that form, it still wasn't perfect. They needed to have an artist go in and clean it up and turn it into something they could use for the animations. But the moons were far smaller and the data wouldn't be ready in time to ship the animation out to the media. So they got sci-fi artist Rick Sternbach to come up with designs for the various Galilean moons. Now, Rick Sternbach is a name that you may be familiar with if you're a Star Trek fan because he worked on Star Trek Next Generation and he very much helped define the look of the 24th century in Star Trek. So in March of 1979, Voyager 1 encounters Jupiter and the public information movie that goes out with it shows these moons that have been you know, fabricated by Rick Sternbach. Now I have to apologize for the quality of this video because I can't find a good quality version of the original Voyager 1. Because most of the ones online are for Voyager 2. Voyager 2 got to Jupiter in July of 1979 and by then they had been able to take the images off the moons and create proper texture maps that could be used for the new Voyager 2 movie. And the easy way to spot that you're watching the Voyager 2 movie is to look at Io because Voyager 1 flew past Jupiter and it discovered volcanoes on Io. So for the Voyager 2 movie, uh, Jim added these particle effects to show something that looked like uh, the volcanic plume coming off of Io. And while this is pretty primitive as particle systems go, Jim Blinn would actually uh, invent particle systems for work on the, the Cosmos TV show. So for the third step of the process, Voyager would then be rendered using a set of programs called polys. It would basically draw polygon models. The model itself was built using uh, points derived from a set of blueprints for the spacecraft, but it wasn't just polygons that were supported. There was a surface of revolution primitive that was specifically for things like the radio antenna, and all those struts, they had an optimal way where you would specify the start and end point and a size, and it would calculate the correct on-screen uh, sizes, 
thereby minimizing the amount of geometry. In some of the early versions, you could only have 100 polygons in the models and had to actually have separate models depending upon whether the spacecraft was seen in front or from behind. The next planet on the tour was Saturn, and of course it came with its own challenges, namely rings. And if you think about it, rings are kind of different from everything else because they can be in front of and behind the planet. So the rings end up getting split into two halves. First he rendered the distant half, and then they would render the planet, and then you would render the forward half of the rings. And on top of this, there was a whole lot of research he did into figuring out the light distribution, the scattering method, the fact that you know, scattering of light coming through the rings behaved differently from scattering light being scattered back from the rings, and then shadowing. So the rings could be shadowed by the planet, the rings could cast a shadow on the planet. Now, of course, the way these things were all rendered separately, so the rings had to think, know where the planet was to actually can do the shadow calculations and similarly the routine that rendered the planet it had to understand where the rings were so it could correctly perform the shadow generation and also for the handful of frames when the camera is passing through the ring plane he had another particle effect but there was also a moon at saturn that required invention of a new technique mimas if you remember has a huge crater one that makes it look a lot like the Death Star. So now if you just do the simple thing and slap the texture onto a sphere, then it looks wrong. So it looks wrong for a number of reasons. First of all, as it rotates and the illumination source remains fixed, the shadows should change on these craters as they move across the face, but they don't. And it becomes very obvious when the big craters come around and the, the dark areas remain the same. This is basically just a texture painted onto the surface. Turns out that Jim Blinn actually invented a technique to deal with this. In his 1978 paper, Simulation of Wrinkled Surfaces, he proposes using something like a texture map which translates to surface height, and then by taking the difference between two neighboring pixels, you can figure out the angle of that surface and then apply that to the illumination, and you have a normal map or a bump map that lets you illuminate a surface and make it look as if it has holes in it or wrinkles or some other structure that it doesn't actually have. You're not changing the geometry, you're just changing the way it reacts to light. Unfortunately, that crater on Mimas is just too big, so he had to go one step further. So again, starting with the real astronomical data, they tried to map it to this imaginary sphere, but then instead of just simply painting it onto the surface, he used this to uh, generate geometry for the object. And so instead of just being a bump map, this became a displacement map, a long time before anyone was talking about displacement maps. And that allowed this rendering where the camera flies low over the surface of Mimas to that very large crater. Now, look, obviously the techniques used here are vastly different than what modern displacement maps used. And it's only a very tenuous link, but I still think that the, this is a big step forward in you know, computer graphics. And look, I'm not an expert on this by any means, and I'm sure there's other obscure examples that I uh, can claim to be first. But nevertheless, this was an important uh, animation to me. And obviously, as uh, Voyagers went further into the solar system, we got new views, new techniques. Hey, we had the color blue in this. That was a big step up from uh, Jupiter and Saturn, right? And you have to remember that JPL is near LA, so there were people from the film business that were seeing these animations and wanted to know how they were done. In fact, Gene Roddenberry apparently uh, got a demo of how this stuff worked. Jim Blinn would work at ILM for a while. In fact, he you know lived in San Rafael, which is really close to me. And of course, ILM were responsible for uh, the Wrath of Khan, the computer-generated sequence for the Genesis effect. That definitely would have taken a lot of hints from this. And it all comes back to these computer visualizations that were created for the press and the public so that they could understand what Voyager was doing in deep space. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.